Welcome to episode 103 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. This episode is part of my series, Dad Talk, and I've invited Will Walter to have a chat. What's this series about? Glad you asked. I'm inviting everyday dads on the show to talk about what's important to them. Episodes may range from a little bit of Liberty Talk to a whole lot or even none at all. This series is all about raising the voices of dads and listening to what they have to say. And that means you may hear dads discuss ideas that you disagree with. That's okay. Their voice is important, and you cannot raise the voice of another if you spend time shutting them down. In this episode, Will opens up about being a dad while managing his own mental health. Let's dive in and hear what he has to say. Will Walter, thanks for joining me here on Liberty Dad, Dad Talk. And we're going to talk to Will about being a dad, because that's what Dad Talk is about. And Will is very interested in um, his three daughters, and he's going to tell us about in just a moment. And he is going to tell us about the challenges in raising three daughters in a world where mental health challenges can abound. And so we're going to talk about that, probably talk a little bit about how the world itself is not very healthy, um, which adds to the challenges, of course. So, Will, let's dive right into it. Tell me a little bit about you, what you already were doing, and hopefully you don't have to repeat too much. No, um, th- this is an easy one. Um, I, I have I've been married for 15 years. Uh, my wife and I have three girls, 11, 7, almost 8, and 2. And um, we've, you know, they're, they're my everything. They're the four of them. My wife and my three girls are why I do what I do. Um, they, you know, I want to give them, I want to give them everything. I want to, right. I don't, I don't ever, you know, I want to teach them the right way, but I don't ever want to tell them no. Right. You know, and, and it's been a journey to get to this point. I was, I was kind of an ogre in my, my younger dad days. Um, mm. I was, I wasn't a very fun husband or father and, and that, you know, there were some events that happened and, and they led to a, a, a mental health diagnosis of, of bipolar one mm-hmm. that happened about five years ago at this point. And it's been a journey. It's been a journey to get through diagnosis and being on medicine and being hospitalized with the medicine and having my kids see me at my absolute worst where right. I don't feel connected to my body and let, let alone the, the, the souls in my home. Um, it's, it's been hard, but you know, it, it's important to raise awareness and it's important for my girls to see that they can express their emotions and they, there's a, a peaceful, powerful, positive way to, to get those emotions off your chest and out of your mind. And, and it, there's, there's a way to do things with what's happening in your mind and heart. And it, 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 it isn't a bad thing to, to show your emotions in this world. Right. You know, it's, um, I don't know that, I, I can't necessarily say for certain that I have any connection to bipolar. Mm-hmm. The reason for that is when I was younger, my mother was diagnosed as what they called manic depressive, depre- mm-hmm. depressive. I think it's manic depressive yeah. at that time. And yeah. I'm not, I, I think that is now since been called bipolar two, I think. I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, when the uh, DSM, which is the the manual for psychiatrists, mm-hmm. when that changed, I think from the third to the fourth, it went from manic depressive to bipolar. Okay. And so those are those are right there. Right, and I remember that she. Uh, I remember one day. I don't. I don't know the details of why she got the diagnosis. So I, I have no mm-hmm. idea what's going on there. I do remember one particular incident where. There, there's three of us. So there's myself, my sister, my younger brother, and we're each separated by six years. So my sister is six years younger, and my brother's six years younger than my sister. Mm-hmm. Um, so at one point, well, yeah, I think we always went to different schools. You know how they separate them by elementary, middle school, and then high school. I don't. I think we always were in separate mm-hmm. schools just because of our age differences. And I remember mm-hmm. my dad came and picked us all up one day. We all were like what's going on, bud? You know? And so he took us home. My mom is just bawling her eyes out. And she's talking about how she was like a bad mom. And we're like, 
what in the world? Like we had no idea what was going on. Right. Uh, I think that was the only, the only experience that I would attribute to mental health, like very clearly anything else. Mm-hmm. I would, it would be like one of those where you're like, well, I could kind of see where that might be an, an issue with mental health. But, but as far as the only one that very clearly stands out that I don't need anybody to, to kind of push me into that direction and say, yeah, that's probably some mental health issues. That would be one. Yeah. I know that they prescribed her medication and, uh, she started taking it. Now, I don't know if the medication was uh, played a role in this particular incident because it's, it's, again, a lot of things weren't divulged to us necessarily. So mm-hmm. we, you know, we didn't really have um, a, a clear, like nobody came and sat us down and said, all right, you know, mom's not, you, you know, doing so well. She's got to take this. Med-. Like there was none of that kind of stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, but uh, I remember that at one, she used to sleep on the couch a lot like almost all the time. And Mm -hmm. it was because she had grown up in a very abusive home. And when I say very abusive, I don't mean what people think of today as abusive, where if like a kid gets spanked or something like that. I mean, abusive to, to, to the degree that most people can't even fathom, right? Like just very, just heart wrenching, horrid stories. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that played a role in just kind of like, I, I, I don't really know the details, but I know that one day she was sleeping on the couch and because of that medication, she looked over and there was like a marble table and mm. she started seeing like creatures coming out of the marble coming at her. And mm. my dad, my dad was like, we're done. We're done with this. And you know, all I, all, so all I know is that he took the medication, he dumped it and he was like, no, we're, we're not doing this. Cause this is, this is clearly not working. Now, I, I would always describe my mom as neurotic, right? And I, and I describe mm-hmm. myself as neurotic as well. So even though, and, and it's it's kind of, what's interesting is I've, I've seen some mental health uh, practitioners myself for a number of different mm-hmm. things. And mm-hmm. I have since learned, not only mental health practitioners, but also doctors, exactly how to tell them my story. Because I feel like if I tell them my story in a, in the way that I would normally do it, that they it's 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 like they trip over themselves to grab the the bipolar diagnosis, you know. Yeah. I, and I, yeah. I don't necessarily think that it, I don't think it fits for me, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. So, but uh, so so I, I you know so this is a very interesting topic to me because it's mm-hmm. one that I haven't really explored a lot, but yeah. also you know, one that I've, that, that has kind of touched me a little bit. So, so what in, 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 again, at any, I, I, this is a very personal thing. So at any point you're more than welcome to be like, ah, let's skip over that and we'll just move right on. Okay. If it's, if it's a little too personal or whatever, but I'm curious. So so you're, I think you said you're what, 36 now. Yeah. I'm 36 now. And you got the diagnosis at 31. Yeah. And then so what was it that led to the diagnosis? Like what kind of triggered it and said, hey, we got to look uh, into something. Yeah, I I didn't know what it was at the time, but I was in the, the, the midst of a major manic episode. And manic mm-hmm. episodes are where you just do things that are out of character. You do things that are grandiose, um, things that don't fit you as a person i'm a active member of the the lds church the mormon church Mm -hmm. and i went to my uh, beginning of the year sales meeting for my job and i had never had alcohol before and i drank like a fish i wanted every ounce of liquor on the planet i proposed to a woman even though i'm married i didn't talk to my wife for the entire seven days I was at the meeting. I wasn't sleeping. One of the major symptoms when you sit down with a psychiatrist or a therapist first, and they're, they're trying to ascertain where you're at. They're going to ask you one of the, one of the bipolar things is how's your sleep. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was working about 18 hours a day and sleeping maybe one or two hours a day. And I wasn't tired the next day. I was, I was so charged up on my own oxygen. And 
um, it led to some major fights. When I came home from that sales meeting, there were some some major things with with my family and, and my wife and I, and and it led to an attempt on my life because with, with these manic episodes where you're really really high and then you always got to come down. And when I came down, it was just this crashing realization of who was that? Right. That was me. That's me in those pictures on social media. But I don't recognize who I see looking back at me. Right. And so, you know, it got to that point where I didn't think me being around was of service to anybody. Mm -hmm. And so from there, thankfully, the attempt wasn't successful. I um, got in with a psychologist, a therapist, and she immediately said, you need psychiatric care. And that's where the medicine is prescribed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the psychiatrist is going through the, the questionnaire to kind of work through those things and and she lands on bipolar one and and there's you know there's a lot of symptoms there's there's the sleep there's the the uh, grandiosity where you build mm -hmm. yourself up and um, there's little ticks of where you you feel more creative for a period of time than you normally do there is there is um, shopping is a, is a thing bipolar people blow out their credit cards. Bipolar people will drive to another state to buy a car they saw on Craigslist. Um, for me, it has always been these pins. Mm -hmm. I will go to the grocery store and I'll go to the school supply market and I'll just buy four or six or eight, eight two packs every time. And so it was just formalizing all these things. Mm -hmm. And as I got this diagnosis, I, I you know rocked my world personally and professionally. And I had to make a decision. Am I going to take the medicine and go to therapy and try to get better? Or am I going to put my head down and put it in the sand and just keep trucking and probably end my marriage as a result, maybe lose the ability to see my kids mm -hmm. and what's going to happen to me? You know, is the next attempt going to be unsuccessful as well? We don't know. And so I made the decision. I said, I'm going to jump into the medicine. I'm going to do, start doing my own research. I read, I read everything about bipolar one. And I, you know, I read some personal stories that had been published out there and saw myself in a lot of these people's experiences. And then as through the process of therapy, I saw in the rearview mirror, this moment as a teenager mm. was bipolar episode. This moment as a young man was a bipolar episode. This moment when your wife told you she was pregnant the first time was a bipolar response. And so it, it gave some clarity to those moments when I was, um, when I was younger and I didn't understand. I, I remember distinctly being in an argument with, with my wife and saying, you know, she'd say, why are you doing this? This isn't like you. And and I would say, I don't know, but here I am, you know, red in the face and just mm -hmm. pounding the walls with anger. And, and I, I, I had to make that decision mm -hmm. to either fix it or throw it all out the window. Right. And I didn't want to start over. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be by myself because to your, your story earlier, that medicine it it changes everything it changes mm -hmm. your perceptions of the reality and i was afraid for a while on one of the medicines that if i got off my bed mm -hmm. i would die wow so i didn't leave my room for gosh 10 days at one point i didn't leave my room i didn't get off the bed except to go to the restroom and came right back and couldn't get out of bed you know debilitating panic attacks and and you know, I'm I'm a I'm a salesperson, not a not a transactional retail thing, but traveling to clients around my region, and and I couldn't I couldn't make visits, I couldn't make calls, and it was this, you know, and my kids are seeing me just, with, I was behind a closed door a lot at first because mm -hmm. I said I don't want them to see me like this, but then my wife had this conversation with me, and she said they need to see you getting through this. Mm. And it's okay for them to see you doing something hard. And they were, I mean, my 11 year old was six and change. The seven, almost eight year old was 
three, four years old. And so, you know, it, it's hard, but taking those steps to get the diagnosis, to work through the treatment, to educate myself. And, you know, medicine was, was it, it's what stabilized me. It's what pulled mm-hmm. me out of the manic episode. But the therapy, the working on myself, making myself a better person, being able to identify symptoms, being able to find red flags so I could pump the brakes mm. before yeah. they elevated into another manic episode. Those, those were really key things on the front end. And, you know, the, the constant self-evaluation of, okay, I, you know, I'm feeling this desire to go buy ink pens. Do I really need ink pens? Is that a, is that a small thing? Are we really concerned about that? Or, you know, when I, when I close a sale, I mean, I, I I work in, in sales that can run in the high five to six figures per transaction. And it's a really good feeling. And I think Mm -hmm. I'm really cool when I close that sale and I'll walk out of the customer's office and I have to check myself. I'll walk down the hallway and then I'll sit down and I'll say, okay, you did good. You get to pay your mortgage next month. Not you did good. Let's go buy a car and, and, and drugs and hookers. Right. You know, and so it's, it, it's really learning about who you are at the root of it all. Gotcha. That's very interesting. Um, you know, as you, as you list the, this is what makes it, I think what makes it hard for some mm-hmm. people is, and, and you're not doing it, is that <clears throat> when, when somebody expresses any kind of similarity, it feels mm-hmm. like a lot of people want to leap, you know, yeah. or if you say, you know what, I might be a little bit like this, mm-hmm. then people also want to take that leap. And I, and I feel like there are a lot of people who could benefit from some mental health training. Let's call it that, right? I don't know if that's an appropriate yeah. term, but we'll go with that. But yeah. they could benefit from some mental health training. And I'm talking about people who may not be full-on diagnosable bipolar, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's the kind of the value of your story is to say like, here is where he, here is where it gets out of control mm-hmm. right yeah. but also at the same time to say here are some things that are unhealthy yeah right and to say like you know maybe maybe for somebody who's like hey you know what do i really need to buy this thing that they're buying right maybe it's just something weird and it's no big deal Maybe right. it's maybe it's something that uh, that is a significant deal, and maybe it's somewhere in between, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, so so let me ask, um, mm-hmm. uh, so you mentioned being uh, uh, I think Latter Day Saint, right? <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yep. And then uh, I think we know each other through what we might call Liberty Twitter. Um, or yep. the libertarian yep. circles. So yep. tell me how each of those, if at all, played a role mm-hmm. uh, or, or continues to play a role in your your path forward. Okay, excellent question. Um, I think we'll start with church, mm-hmm. um, faith, just because that's, that's, that's center to everything. Sure. Um, I think... For me, my faith is, you know, it's it's a it's a three-legged stool with my wife. It's me, my wife, and our faith. Mm -hmm. And so I made the decision early in the process and have and I return to that often. Um, you know, our faith is what holds us together. We made promises to each other when we got married that we would be together. Um through thick and thin. And, you know, we, we have seen the, the uh, extremes of the pendulum and sickness and in health and, and, you know, it's a shared thing. And one of the, I don't think this is unique to, to uh, the Mormon faith, but one of the, one of the centerpieces of our faith is that when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, he didn't just 
die for our sin or did, didn't just suffer for our sins there. He felt everything we've ever felt. He felt our mm-hmm. hardships. He felt our, our sadness. And so I lean on the fact yeah. that, you know, I'm feeling particularly manic or maybe I'm flipped and I'm on the depressive side. Mm-hmm. And I live in Salt Lake City um, and it's cloudy probably about four and a half months a year. And so that weather can lend itself to depressive feelings and, mm-hmm. and or, you know, whatever the, whatever the external circumstances, whether it's the weather or sales aren't going well, or just my brain says, Hey, it's time to eat dirt for a while. Um, I, I can lean on my belief that you know, Jesus Christ suffered and mm-hmm. felt what I'm feeling and he can help me get through to the other side of it because he did too. And it helps to know that my wife has those same beliefs and she can help direct me back to those when I'm, you know, out, out in, out in left field with, with my mental state. And it's something we share, you know, mm-hmm. living in Utah and being Mormon is, is kind of a, it's interesting. I'm not from Utah. We're not from Utah. We, we met in St. Louis, we moved to San Antonio and we moved to Utah 18 months ago. And this ties into the, the libertarian liberty Twitter circles, actually. Um, when the pandemic started two years ago, right now, basically, I had been, you know, I, I was raised in a Reagan adoring home. I was, you know, I was, I, you know, I chugged the GOP Kool-Aid and voted for Trump in 16 because mm-hmm. better than the alternative. And I only saw one alternative. And when the pandemic started, it just hit me the wrong way how 45 was handling mm-hmm. things. There was no empathy. There was no care. There was, there was no, hey, this sucks. And we're going to have to struggle, but we're going to struggle together. And as a nation, we're going to get out to the other side. And, you know, I was unemployed for a time. And I mean, God, I think my last day on the job was February 28th, 2020. Wow. And I was in the process of interviewing for other jobs because this was one of those long tail, hey, we're going to let you go on 30 day things. Excuse me. And I was interviewing and the, the weekend that everything shut down, if you remember that, I think it was that, that Friday, March 12th ish, mm-hmm. there was a, a news pop up on my phone. NCAA announced as the tournament will be played with no fans 45 minutes later. NCAA announces no tournament this year. And then um, twice a year, the leadership of the Mormon church gets together. We call it general conference. And they broadcast out two full days of, of talks that they give of just faith building Mm -hmm. things and and instruction for the next six months. And then the church announced general conference will be held with no attendees present. And then the church sent out an email that said, all in-person church meetings suspended worldwide until further notice. Mm -hmm. And these are just things that just shape who you are. And, you know, the, the jobs I was interviewing for, they all said, uh, we'll we'll call you. It's a little crazy right now. Right. So here I am, I'm unemployed. I I have a six month old baby at the time. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I look at each other, we say, uh, what are we going to do here? And and the state of Texas, they do a lot of things right there, but their their unemployment sucks. Mm. It's not very good on the percentage side. And you know, and I was I was concerned. And I, you know, we got together and you know, we said we said prayers. And and the next day, somebody from a prior job, but who was still in the same industry, she called me and she said, I know you're looking. Um, I can give you a job tomorrow but you have to move from San Antonio to Salt Lake. Hmm. And I said, let me talk to my wife. And uh, we talked and we said, we can uh, take that step into the darkness together mm-hmm. and we'll have a paycheck next Friday right. where we can right. sit here in the house and hope for the best. And so in that vein of, I control my destiny with my wife, um, we 
bought our house on FaceTime. Didn't see our house until the day before we closed. Oh, wow. Moved to Utah in June of 2020. Mm -hmm. And when we moved there, we made the decision to register as independents. And so it was just a complete reset. I mean, think about it. Moving from Texas, which is this, right. this you know, deep red state. It's not as purple as they tell you it is. It's still a deep red state. Move from Texas to Utah, which is red but Mormon red. And deregister as Republicans, register as independents. And we voted for Joe Jorgensen in, hmm. in, uh, in November of 20. And it was, I forget what it was. I think, honestly, I think it was that hashtag that was going crazy. No libertarian under 1K. And one person I had found, wow. po they posted that hashtag. And I just, I followed the hashtag through. And I just saw all these people and none of them were angry and none of them were, the world's going to end if Trump wins, the world's going to end if Trump loses. It was a, it was a new way. It was, it was like a, a, a third part of my brain opening up to, mm -hmm. wait a minute, these people aren't Democrats, they're not GOP. We can think about this in a different light. We can right. move this into a new lens and you know, thinking about it here, talking with you, it's it, it's very much kind of what I had to do with my life five years ago. I had to reevaluate who I was, how I thought about things, how I approached things. And, you know, I've, I've, I've taught my daughters, the uh, the 11 year old was ecstatic. She said, I don't know who Jorgensen is, but she's a girl and we need girls. <laughs> and, you know, it on the front end in its very most basic form, female representation is a real thing. Right. And, you know, it, it, it's been a great opportunity to, because when you, when you, when you look at things without this feeling of innate allegiance, mm -hmm. you know, there's a picture of Ronald Reagan on the wall on my house growing up. And when you move that, when you take that out of your heart and cast it away, you can see things for what they really are. And it's been a chance to teach my kids about government mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. civics at their root level are not taught in school anymore. Right. And, and so, you know, it all ties together this progression from five years ago, I was in a hospital to reinventing myself and recommitting mm -hmm. myself to my faith and you know having the faith to recommit to god to take a move out to utah and and you know it's it's uh it it's been a spectacular thing and right you know i i, I love the uh sorry my laptop's making noise at us um i i love the the friends i've made the mm -hmm. eye-opening experience that it's been to learn i've connected with people who live just up the street from me in utah and we didn't realize it and you know we've had a chance we've gotten together and had some discussions and and we're doing things pragmatically and and trying to provide that other alternative and it's it's fun to to show my kids hey community involvement mm -hmm. is so important and it's it, it's been a learning experience for all of us. I mean, the last two years has just fine tuned a lot of our, our right. the way we look at life, you know, right. and and it's it's been it's been really rewarding to mm -hmm. see my kids on the other side of this. Utah just, you know, we're 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 not Florida when it comes to freedom and COVID and things, but our governor just shifted our official categorization of the pandemic to a seasonal severe respiratory emergency oh, wow. so he downgraded everything from our hair's on fire we're all going to die to if you're sick stay home there's treatment if you need it mm -hmm. get us if you do right you know i mean my god imagine that right right no idea. and so you know it's been, it's been a crazy journey i i always think of it was february 17th of 2017 so it's been five years and six days since I was diagnosed. And if you had told me five years ago, I'd be living in Salt Lake City. I'd be not a registered Republican. Mm -hmm. I'd be 
a better dad now than I was then, a better husband now than I was then, I would have said, uh, what? Right. And look, here we are. Wow. That's a, it, it, it's kind of a mind blowing story, I think. Um, you know, you've got three girls and my knowledge about bipolar isn't extensive. You know, I, I've read a few things and hit or miss whether I, what, you know, what I actually remember, but, um, I know you, you mentioned one of them was 11. And so that's mm-hmm. kind of getting into the teen years, you know, where, um, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I have a boy. I was just talking to, who was I <laughs> talking to, to somebody, I was talking to somebody and I said, you know, it seems like when girls, you know, boys can be frustrating early on because they're rambunctious, they're climbing all over the walls, you know, if they're not drawing on them, if they're not poking holes in them, if they're, you know, yes, oh you know, gosh. like boys are just all over. And this is like when they're like my son's age, three to five, and they're toddlers, right? They're just, they're just a handful. Mm-hmm. And I feel like little mm-hmm. girls tend to do what they're told generally, right? And at that age, I mean, for the most, comparatively, <laughs> com- comparatively speaking. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I every kid is still a toddler at the end of the day, but comparatively oh, yeah. speaking, like you, 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 you know, it's it seems to me, and again, I, I'm I've only got the one boy, so maybe I'm speaking totally mm-hmm. in ignorance here, but then it seems to me that once a girl gets to around the 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 preteen, the teenage years, that's when all hell breaks loose, right? Like that's yeah, that's their comparative when a little boy was jumping all over because sometimes my son he'll just for like he'll just run through the house just and you're like <laughs> what is going on here like and yes. it doesn't bother my, my wife was actually commenting just recently she said because she she's a real estate agent so she's out of the house a lot and i work from home because i work for corporate america and my work is on a laptop so I, i'm home all the time and she's like i don't she was here and she was like i don't understand how you deal with this do you know how you how you work <laughs> yeah under these conditions here because he's just running around and i said you know what as long as he's not fussing or being angry or whining i actually find it very easy in most cases uh with with the very few exceptions of being like if i'm trying to get on a zoom call um sometimes i'll go to another room to try to minimize the noise and then he'll follow me with the noise (laughs) you Mm -hmm. know um and uh, i said i said but you know as long as he's having fun because I told her, I said, as long as he's having fun, I can hear him. I know what he, I have an idea what he's doing yep. and I don't have to worry about him. Right. It's when he gets quiet or when he's crying and upset. That's when I have to go and figure out what's going on. Right. Otherwise, I generally have a good like I can tell which toy he's playing with and what he's mm-hmm. doing with it. Right. When we're just by yep. the toy that he's making, he's, he's uh, the sound that's coming from the toy. So, you know, this is a long way to get to my question. But uh when it comes to you know my understanding is that bipolar can be um inherited it's and, hereditary at about a 50 percent rate oh wow and so what kind of thing so there, there's there's two things now that as a dad you have to consider mm-hmm. right there's the standard i'm raising a young lady and there are there are certain things that are just going to be tough for for uh, for young girls in a way that may be different for boys right right um yeah. so because i remember my sister like 13 my mom didn't like her boyfriend and i remember you're ruining my life right <laughs> kind of you yep. know kind of and if my sister ever listens to this podcast uh, I'm, I'm very sorry for divulging all your secrets but uh, <laughs> but you know so i so i i you know there was that challenge there because you know for a little girl at that time you know it probably felt very much like her life was entirely being ruined so i can't imagine mm. if there's any uh you know component of bipolar that's there or just as a young lady gets older you know yeah. if if you know the, the 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 general challenges for women and then add potential bipolar on top of that because right. if we're going to be honest mm-hmm. there are certain areas where women still face challenges in the world where men do not mm-hmm. right yeah. uh, there are certain things that we tend to see as more acceptable for young women uh, or sorry for young men. So some of the behaviors that you mentioned earlier, if you went out and you bought a brand new car because you know you you struck a great deal, um, mm-hmm. a lot of people will be like, ah, whatever. He's spending his money. You know, he worked really hard for it, right? Or if you're like, you know what, I'm gonna go to his, you know this party, people might look down on you 
because you know you're married but they're gonna be like ah mm -hmm. oh, you know they're, they're like yeah men do these things right men right. engage in yeah. these kind of behaviors they drink too much they you know they whatever the, all these other other things but a lot of those things are tend to be off limits in some way for women um you know oh, yeah, so you're, you're exactly right so i'm just curious uh, I, how you're preparing that for that and how you're working to balance all of these things it's a very wide question i guess no, it, it, it's an excellent thing. And it's something that we've, I mean, my wife and I have thought about extensively since, since diagnosis. I mean, um, at, at a 50% heredity rate, one and a half of my daughters are, are uh, going to get tagged with this. And, right. you know, there, there's no, there's no decimal points in, in uh, mental health. You either have it or you don't, I guess, but right. You know, it's interesting with the the eleven year old. She is she is full on in tween mode. She's got her cell phone in the last year. She's she's starting to want to hang out with boys and be around boys and all the things. But she's also my 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 book nerd. She just wants to curl up and read. She'll mm -hmm. she'll sit down and play Xbox with me um, if if I'm playing the right games for her. <laughs> um, but the middle daughter, she is, and you know, it's interesting she adores her older sister and she she's wanting to to go with her and well uh, you know older sister's doing this why can't i do it well she's 11 and, and you're seven and so you can't quite do all the things and mm -hmm. and then my youngest i mean she's two and a half so she's in that toddler stage of mm -hmm. you know just just sit down and and make sure the house doesn't burn down mm -hmm. um but honestly it's the middle child that I see the most similarities between me at seven, almost eight and her at mm -hmm. seven, almost eight. And, you know, at the, at the risk of getting emotional here, it's, it's one of those moments at, if you remember the scene at the end of Forrest Gump, mm -hmm. after he sat on the bench and, and told all of his stories, he goes to Jenny's apartment finally, and she introduces him to Forrest Jr. Right. And he says, is he slow like me? Right. And I feel that, I feel that emotion mm -hmm. every day with my daughters, when, with all three of them. But when, um, the, you know, when Lily, that's the seven-year-old name, when she has these really big emotions and can't express them, mm -hmm. or she just says, I feel angry in my neck. And she says that all the time. I and mean, it always just catches me, angry in your neck, what? Right. But it's this, it's this wicked pendulum swing for her from walking in the door from school. Hi, dad. Happy, you know, happy Lily to two minutes later, she's kicking me and she's hitting and she's screaming. And what's wrong? Why do you feel this? I don't know. I'm just mad. And, and the, you know, there's a lot of other pieces to it as well. It's the sports of creativity. It's she doesn't sleep sometimes. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of things. And so, you know, we've, we've tried to talk through with all three of well the two oldest the two-year-old still she gets a free pass for another couple of years um but we've tried to talk through with the two oldest when things um come up and they're you know they're feeling anxious or they're feeling panic attacks we've we've taught them the coping skills that mm -hmm. my therapist taught me immediately post diagnosis back in the back five years ago and you know, we, we remind them of these things and we encourage, you know, Hey, don't just sit on your phone. Don't just sit on your iPad. Don't just be on the Xbox, go outside and be with people mm -hmm. and interact with people. And you know, I'm not going to make any, any big statements about kids these days and, and all that stuff, but I try and make sure that my girls are out in interacting with, with real reach out and touch people. It's the touch the grass. Days. Yeah, that you see on Twitter all the time. Someone's like, "Hey, go touch grass. Get off. Get off of the internet. Exactly. Go touch grass." And I and I I believe yes. it, one hundred percent. I you know we try to make sure that our son gets out and plays, or gets interaction with other people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and because I just feel that there is no substitute. Um, right. You know, and and this is just a, a, from observation because obviously he's my first mm -hmm. one, so I, so I don't have a lot of. Um, experience with children per se, but just mm -hmm. kind of observing and just knowing my own life, you know, like 
I feel better. The, the, the times that I feel the best are when it's sunny out and I'm out mm -hmm. and it's nice and warm and I'm on my bicycle riding. Nice. Um, you know, those are, those are the times which, which I'm glad it's starting to warm up here um, <laughs> because I, I sometimes do struggle a little bit in the winter, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. because I'll just, uh, it, it's hard to, it's hard to really describe the struggle a little bit, but the, the feeling that I get from getting out, I just feel kind of invigorated, mm -hmm. right? Just, just, you know, like nothing, nothing spectacular. It's not like all of a sudden I walk in the door from having been outside and exercise it. And I just feel like, a, a you know, like a million bucks and I can go and wrestle everybody and, you know, the Royal, you know, match or whatever, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not yes. that, it's not like yes. that level. It's just like, I definitely, there is definitely a distinct difference in how I feel, um, from Absolutely. being outside. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, it, it grounds you. It, it, and it's so important for kids because they, you know, God love them. They have so much coming at them. They have right. homework at school. They have, Oh my God, my friend, tested positive for COVID. So they have to go home for 10 days. And, right. and I don't, because I was at, I, you know, I, I missed school yesterday with a dentist appointment and didn't sit next to them. And, and I want to play Xbox and I want to be, you know, and those, those things, you know, touch grass, go for a bike ride. Um, we, at our house, we have an unobstructed view of the mountains mm -hmm. and oh, there's nice. this 11,000 foot peak wow. right across the street from my house. And so we just sit on the front porch and we'll just, just stare and just yeah. take it in. Wow. And, you know, I mean, you could, you could wax poetic about the beauty of God's creations and yes, that's true. That's what it is, but it's just being present in right now in this right. moment, my dad has his arm around me and I'm okay. Right. And you know, when it's, I mean, in Salt Lake right now, it's, I'm actually traveling for work this week, but in Salt Lake right now, it's 19 degrees. Whoa. So you can't go put your feet in the grass right now, but, uh, Give you know, me the you shivers thinking about it. Right, right, right. It's, you know, it, it's about helping kids learn to be present because half of our problems as adults is because we, we're thinking too far down the road or right. we're, we're breaking our neck, looking over our shoulder. Right. And if we can teach our kids today, be present in today mm -hmm. and don't, don't worry about tomorrow because you're not going to change it. Right. And those are life skills that they need. You're, you're, you made the point earlier about mental health training. And that's, that's what this is in a very informal format. But right. it, it needs to be a, not a huge part, but it needs to be part of a K-12 curriculum. Right. It needs to be all sorts of things. And, you know, it starts, it starts with mom and dad saying, hey, we went through this. You saw us go through this. Let's, let's talk about it. And just be open and honest with the kids. Hey, it's okay to feel. Right. It's okay to feel those things in your chest, in your neck. Like my kid says, it's it's okay to feel those things. It's what you do with those feelings right. that matters. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think that um, I think for a certain portion of the population, you have uh, people that really do need, they, like they need mental health training right like they mm -hmm. actually have something that requires them they may have bipolar they may have um, yeah. i know for a long time i really struggled with um anxiety issues mm -hmm. and hypochondria in particular and it was just it, for the for the longest time there was no mental training there was no it, it just all of a sudden there i was worried about some health matter for no particular good reason right and it was i mean and, and you could i couldn't shake it you know like it, it just was there and, and my friends would be like dude why, why are you even worried about that like st stop worrying about it and i'm like I, I don't think you understand here I, I want to stop worrying about it i can't right. and it was i mean people don't People like to think of me and they're like, oh, dude, you seem pretty well put together and well reasonable. And I'm like, I am actually a basket case. If my ex-wife were honest, she would tell you that, you know, in a nice way, of course. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we left yeah. on good terms. My my current wife, she would probably tell you something similar, also in nicer words. Uh, but effectively, that's that's what it is. And, and, and I've, I think I've learned some strategies over time, you know, mm -hmm. but these were things that I had to kind of figure out on my own 
And the process yeah. of learning on your own um, can make that path more difficult, right? Because you're at first trying to figure out what the hell is even going on. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and and you don't and and you can't tease out. Okay, to what extent is this normal? To what extent is this not normal? Or you know, maybe normal is mm-hmm. you know. I, I know people get pissy about using words like normal and whatnot. You know, but what's expected? What's not expected? Right? And mm-hmm. and and I had no sense of that. And I imagine that you probably had you know at least for a while didn't have any sense either. Like, oh, you know, absolutely. Like, you know, yeah. I'm I'm just experiencing this thing. This is where I am. I'm experiencing yeah. it. You know, must be nor- must must be the thing that happens, right? You know, right. You, just, you make a big sale, and you're excited. And why not go spend some of this money? You know, I worked mm-hmm. hard. I yeah. you know, exactly. you know, I'm super excited about it, right? So yeah. you know, it's 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 pretty interesting. You know, one of the interesting things that I, because because you're on Liberty Twitter. Mm-hmm. And you're on Twitter in general, which is a nasty place. <laughs> it's it's true. A terrible place. But like Chappelle says, it's not real. <laughs> right, right. It's not real. Uh, but, you know, it's it's weird. It's not real. But people tend to, um, they take it home with them. They really oh, do, yeah, I think. Totally. Um, yeah. And so I know that there are things that are not appropriate that may even come, you know, come in conflict with with some of the things that you deal with, how do you manage when you see those kind of things? You know, when you see maybe someone say, maybe one person has said something that's, you know, socialist or whatever, you know, whatever, you know, whatever mm-hmm. is deemed as inappropriate. Yeah. And then another person's yeah. like, you know what, just kill yourself or something like that. You know, those kind of things. Um, I, I, This seems like a cop out answer because we we uh, we use it a lot on Twitter. If you don't like it, keep scrolling. Okay. And you know it, the the thing about Twitter mm-hmm. is you know I, I've gotten to know a, a good number of people. Um, not a huge hundreds number of people, but a, a solid handful of folks I've I've actually had real live communication with. But beyond that. I don't know these people. Right. And so if someone's, you know, there, there was one the other day, it was a, uh, a vet that was, it was one of those things where you liked it or, or somebody else liked it. And I saw it because you had liked it. And he expressed that he was having a hard time and his PTSD was off the charts and he was going to go lay down and he didn't express intent for self harm. But he just said, hey, I'm having a hard day and I'm putting it out there that I'm having a hard day. And, you know, I, I dropped a, a, a comment. I just said, hope you can find the peace you need today. And it's, it's one of those things where with, with mental health, bipolar is with me the rest of my life. It's who I am. But it doesn't define my experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my uh, therapist, when I when I. They, they call it graduating when you, when you finish therapy. When I graduated therapy, that last appointment, she said, she said, you're in remission now. Mm-hmm. And it seems weird to apply that to anything but cancer. But she said, you're in remission, Will. And don't get comfortable okay. because you have to continue working every day. So when I do see something that's particularly holy crap on Twitter, it's it's a combination of just keep scrolling and it's it's also maybe I should just sign out of the app for the day. Yeah. I just I, I police my my time in it or I, I try and counteract it with time with my two-year-old. Right. You know, I get down on the floor with her or my wife a year ago right now surprised me with a, a labradoodle puppy. And oh, so fun. we have this horse of a dog now. You know, he's a year old and he's 65 pounds and taller than my wife when he stands up. Right. It's an experience, but he's a lover and I get down and I just let him just sit on my lap and hurts like heck when he sits on my lap because he's so heavy. But right. it's, right. it, you know, it's, it's using the tools around you, whether it's that internal stuff of, okay, mm-hmm. well, how do we cope with this? How do we distract from this? You know, I have my go-to stuff. I mm-hmm. watched all nine seasons of Seinfeld 
probably a hundred plus times, if not more. I just turn it on and just hearing that boom, 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 boom. It just, right. it just distracts me. And I just right. am able to through whatever, you know, whatever crazy stuff I see on Twitter. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, you know, I, the reason I'm asking these things is because I know that when people watch this or not, you know, a lot of people aren't bipolar, right? So they might immediately go, well, it's not really for me. But I think that, I think there's something to learn from people that are forced to deal with coping mechanisms for mental health. Because a lot of people, I think they just kind of <clears throat> will uh, skate on by, right? Through, all, through their whole life. And their life might have been better, but they manage well enough just kind of roughing it. And I think there's mm. other people that just that it's not going to work for them. Maybe they have an actual condition that needs to be addressed or, mm. you know, may, maybe their circumstances or whatever the case may be. But there, there, there's something there that's not going to allow them to just rough it out, you know, tough it out mm. or whatever. And mm. I think, you know, these are the kind of lessons that we can look and say, well, you know, maybe this is applicable applicable to my life in a smaller sense, right? Um, or a similar sense in some way. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily be smaller, but you know, hey, yeah. I see something that's offensive. You know, maybe I'm a a person of color and I see somebody saying some things that are, you know, pretty unpleasant. Yeah, maybe it's just time to log out and go play with my dog. You know, yeah. uh, you know, go go play with my child, or you know, go go, go hang out with some good friends that I know that are good people. You know, mm. and kind of remember. That Twitter is not real, right? Even though that it's yeah. real people usually saying these things, right? A lot of it is, a lot of it is people that were willing to to say and post these things because they're disconnected from any potential repercussions from them. Right. You know, yeah. It's it's one thing to maybe say something to you online that's a little mean, versus mm -hmm. to say it to you in your face when. Who knows? You may swing on me, right? <laughs> Not you, but right. you know somebody. Yeah, yeah. And yeah so, no, it's so I think these are good lessons to learn. And and honestly, you know, like I said earlier on, I you know I've been diagnosed. <laughs> this is why I stopped going to mental health professionals because I swear to God, every time I go to one, they've got some mm -hmm. new diagnosis they're ready to throw at me. So like what they've diagnosed me with, um, well, I don't want to say they formally diagnosed, but they've at least talked about and said, hey, maybe there's something here, right? Um, but um, Asperger's, bipolar, mm -hmm. um, anxiety, um, general anxiety. Uh, depression was actually one that never actually came up, mm -hmm. oddly enough. Um, although probably pretty close. When they started doing the, the bipolar, that's mm -hmm. when I started realizing what I was saying to them and maybe to shut up. <laughs> Because <laughs> the way I would describe it, I would say, like, I observe myself and I observe people like my wife, who is what I would think of as a very typical person. And and I and I mean that only in the sense of mental health and, you know, standard confidence and, you know, those kind of things. Right. Like I see a lot more people that are similar, you, you, you know, there than I do me. And yeah. I said, it, sem it seemed like, they, and this is what I would actually say, I would be like, there's like a, a, a upper limit and a lower limit for their fluctuations in temperament yeah. and mood. And I, and I would say, mine seemed to be wider than everybody else. And they're like, have you ever considered bipolar? And I'm like, have you ever <laughs> considered I might turn on you right now? No. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm just like, and, and I've, they've said that so many times. And I'm like, and I remember my mom, you know, and they diagnosed her as mad. And now my mom and I, other than her being a woman and me being a man, we are basically like spitting images of each other. So the mm -hmm. personality and all that stuff is, you know, very much, uh, you know, extremely similar. It's like it's it's like kind of creepy similar in a way. And um, they diagnosed my mom with manic depression uh depressed de de manic depression yeah manic depression and um and, and they gave her medication and it didn't work and i remember they put me on medication for anxiety and uh that was a trip it was and and, and it to, because of that experience i refuse any medication for psychiatric health now 
until we have something yeah. until they can measure something but just based on my you know me walking in and sitting down and telling them a few stories I, I'm going to refuse medication, you know, and, and, and I, I wouldn't say for anybody to do this, right? Like this is mm -hmm. purely based on my personal experience and having some really negative reactions. Um, mm -hmm. So um, you're not alone in it though, because nobody says, Oh, I love my antipsychotics. Right. Right. Well, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the, <clears throat> um, so it, it started out with just GERD oddly mm -hmm. enough. I went to the doctor and I was like, look, I think there might be something going on with my diet. I don't really know, but I think I've got, you know, I've got some heartburn going on and I'm like in my, in my mid twenties mm -hmm. and they're like, okay, well here, take this pill. I took this pill. It doesn't really work. It kind of works sometimes it seems like, but other times it doesn't seem like it's doing a, a, a damn thing. So I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. well, whatever. So I go back and I'm like, yeah, it's not working. You know? And then after a while I started like, maybe there's something serious here that they're missing because we keep not getting results. So I started getting mm -hmm. nervous. And uh, then they were like, well, maybe you just got anxiety. And I'm like, yeah, because I started out just curious, no mm -hmm. concerns, just like, hey, let's let's take care of this. And then we didn't get resolution. Now I'm starting to get nervous, right? And so they gave me, oh, it's I know at one point, I think they gave me Paxil. I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, um, but it was one of those select serotonin reuptake inhibitors, mm -hmm. um, SSRI. And I took that and I, would, I was supposed to take it twice a day and I would take it and about a half an hour later, I would just be lethargic, like just lay my head on the keyboard and just practically drooling out of my mouth, laying there for like 30, 40 minutes before yeah. I, mean, I could not function. It was just, it was t terrible. So mm -hmm. after a while they were like, well, you know, you got your body gets, your body needs to get used to it. I'm like, okay. So uh, my body doesn't get used to it. So I made the mistake of just abruptly not taking it anymore. And turns out this is a bad idea. So mm -hmm. yeah. all of a sudden I was having the most bizarre thoughts. Just I was forgetting things that I wouldn't normally forget. Like I forgot yeah. the word dog at one point and I had to describe it to my ex-wife. I was like, and it was freaking me out because like you might forget a birthday or somebody's name and you're like ah whatever you know that happens you forget mm -hmm. the word dog and you're you're gonna freak yeah. so now yeah. i'm freaking out then they put me on cymbalta and then they were like they're like they're, and i was like okay what's the plan here and they're like you're on cymbalta and i was like okay you didn't hear what i just said my question was what is the plan and they're like you're on cymbalta and i'm like that is not a plan so I actually created my own weaning off of it plan mm -hmm. where they said like it takes two weeks for the medication to really kind of settle into your system. And mm -hmm. so I said, all right, I was supposed to take one a day. So I took one every day. And then after two weeks, I said, I'm going to skip a day. And just about, you know, I, I, somewhere in that skip time, I could start feeling the effects of not being on the medication coming on. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, right about the yeah. same time that I, I would need to take a pill. So I, so I was skipping a day and I did that for two weeks. Then I would skip two days for two weeks, so on and so forth. Right. And then eventually mm -hmm. I got to where I was like skipping like six days, seven days, something like that. And I was mm -hmm. like, all right, this is long enough for me just to now drop it. And then I dropped yeah. it and I was like, all right, never again. <laughs> this is not, yeah. this is not for me because I didn't get any, any of the benefits and it for me it felt like um it was very much like a hook being mm -hmm. a fish with a hook and you yeah. you're just you've got this hook in your mouth and, and 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 you hope that the fisherman will take it out and let you free and and it just that, that's what it felt like and i do not like feeling hooked on stuff um it's kind of weird so i don't know if you had any of those kind of experiences with the with the medication oh, um, man. I mean, the, the most obvious one. In 2017, at diagnosis, I weighed 220 pounds. Okay. And I come to you today at 325. Okay. And so I, I gained 75 pounds in six months. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that just screws with your head because right. 
you know, everything's changing and nothing, right. but you haven't changed anything except that damn white little pill at nine o'clock every night. Um, I used to, I was an avid runner back then. I would run you know, six, eight, 10 miles at a time. Mm-hmm. I would run up to 50 a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and with the first prescription, the, 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 uh, this is not going to sound scientific at all. Can't remember the way to describe it, but what it did is it cut the highs off. So when you would have that that peak from exercise, mm-hmm. it would stop my body from from getting all the way up on the high. Gotcha. And so when you're running, you know, you get about a mile, mile and a half in, and it starts to kick in, and that's what keeps you going. When it doesn't kick in, the rest of your body's like, well what the heck this doesn't feel good anymore so it, it took runners high away from me oh wow and i mean imagine that imagine how you feel after a ride yeah, yeah. not feeling that you just you, then you just hurt and it just sucks right and so i i still haven't been able to fully get back to running because you know my frame carries a hundred and change more pounds than it did i will say i have lost a lot of weight and I'm almost within a hundred pounds of where I started because I've been way above that. So it's been, it's been, a, a, it's been an experience to get that back and it's going to take time, but I'm in control of what's happening between my ears now. Whereas, you know, when I was on all those meds, I, I didn't feel in control. I felt angry mm-hmm. with the last one that I was on. It was Latuda was the last one. And my wife would just say to me, she said, you're angry all the time. You're extra angry. You're just mad all the time. You're mad at this. You're mad at that. And that led to our decision to stop all medicine. And I did a cold turkey as well. And it was weird. It, you know, you just feel this. It's almost that moment of being in a car, but being a passenger when the brakes get slammed, you feel the car stopping. Right. But you're still moving. Right. And then it's going to come. And that's what it felt like because I was on, I mean, my God, some of the stuff they had me on right out of the gate because I had attempted self-harm. They went really hard sure. on some of those. And, you know, it's, it sucked. I, I don't intend to ever go back on those mm-hmm. um, because it, you know, it, it makes you, it makes you reconsider your, realities and i don't even mean you know widen widening the lens to learn about mental health i mean you know is are are there people outside my bedroom door trying to kill me Mm -hmm. type things and right i was i was an agoraphobe for a good period of time because of those medicines and you know it it feels weird to get to that place because of that slow build up Mm -hmm. you know it takes I mean, they told me between six and eight weeks for it to be fully in your system. So keep pushing, you know, keep trying, Mr. Walter, do this. Don't, don't, don't quit yet. Give it time. Give right. it time. And, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things. I mean, think about the name of the category of the pill, antipsychotics. Right. What are, what are we doing here? And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sitting in a hotel in Colorado. So is the dispensary across the street the answer? I don't know. I'm not a professional. I've never gone that route for help. Um, I think, God, I just think so much of it could be solved with, with just education right. and informing people. And not even to the point, you know, the macro level of this symptom is this. Do this if you see this. But just if you feel antsy, Find something that can distract you. Right. Find something that can take your mind off of what made you feel antsy in the first place. That's at a second grade level right there. And that could change an adult's life. Right. If they were to internalize that instruction and identify mm. that the next time they felt that way and turned to a distractor. Right. So, you know, I, I picked up a, a weird, not weird, because it's really cool. I picked up an interesting skill while I was on medicine and stuck in my bed, I cross stitch. And I, 
I, you know, it's not like the, the pillows that our grandmas had that had the, you know, the, the psalm on it. I cross stitched these amazing, intricate Star Wars scenes. Huh. And, you know, I, I'm doing one and I'll, I'll post a picture of it on Twitter um, when I get home on Friday. But it's, it's a Boba Fett profile. Mm-hmm. And it's this deep, you know, multicolor thing, but it's very much a, a, a coping thing. And it shifts my attention from, oh my gosh, this situation situation is hard right now to how many how many squares over am I going to stitch mm-hmm. how many up am I going to stitch and right this current process has taken me 13 months and I'm wow. still not done wow it's you know you pick up weird skills it's it's it is a little bit of that creativity that right. is a symptom right. of bipolar however it's correctly engaged with and it's constructively used for me gotcha. so gotcha. it's one of those things so you're not taking medication now then. And instead, it sounds like you're finding uh, or you found ways to manage without medication, yeah. which yeah. I like if somebody can do that, I think that is absolutely the best route. Right. Absolutely. Like, And, and I think yeah. that for anything, like if for sure. if you can just drink some water and your headache will go away. Right. Like you're better off than taking an aspirin. Not that I have right. any, I don't have any problems with aspirin or necessarily any medication. Um, I do right. feel that our society consumes medication way too much. Oh, yeah, totally. And I feel like part of the reason is because we don't engage in finding ways to um, to resolve or mitigate some of the things that are ailing us or that we're facing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, which, you know, some of them, you know, well, they're all in effect natural technically, but some of the ones that were, you know, are unexpected, we'll go with that term, right? Unexpected. Yeah. So like yeah. you have bipolar, uh, that's, that's unexpected, right? But everybody yeah. faces some of the same things that people with bipolar face just on a much, much, much smaller scale and mm-hmm. not, you, you know, but, but you're still facing these things, mm-hmm. you know? And in my case, um, you know, I, I joke with people and I say, well, I'm a basket case and, uh, you know, or I'm neurotic. I'll, I'll say that, you know, and so a lot of the symptoms that you've expressed early on, I can identify on a small scale. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've I've had moments where I'm king of the world and I'll take on anything and I'll just, you know, I'm 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 moving so fast that I'm pretty much bulldozing people because they're mm-hmm. in my way. Um, yeah. I don't really get the the drop so much, although there are times where I just kind of like, uh, it's very rare, but there are some times where for like maybe a day or two, it's everything I got to even get out of bed. Yeah. Like, yeah. like I've, I've, I've had times where literally, and I'm not even joking, I've literally been like grabbing my arm and putting my arm, you know, to get myself out of bed. It's, 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 it's yeah. kind of weird, but those are very, those are very, very infrequent. Um, th- those situations. Um, but one of the things that I've personally found that really help keep me kind of focused and in line, and it's it's kind of difficult, is to maintain a, a healthy diet and mm-hmm. exercise. Those two things. Yeah. Um, if if I would, I'm, I'm very ter- notorious for not being consistent. So I'll get into a routine just as I'm getting ready to dump it. <laughs> or, or yeah. you know, or, yes. or I don't want to say dump it, but you know, break it. Um, just as yeah. I'm getting ready to you know get into it, I'm I'm breaking it. And uh, but for me, the things that really keep me grounded are healthy diet, which is kind of like a paleo type diet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so like basically meat and vegetables and fruits and nuts and seeds. Uh, basically mm-hmm. eating the perimeter of the grocery store. Um, sure. Very low sugar. Like yeah. I will, uh, I, I generally try not to consume more than like 20 grams of sugar in a day. And that's, that's extremely low. I mean, I, I couldn't drink a, an entire can of soda or uh, that, oh, yeah. cause that's like, uh-huh. that's like four days worth or something or th- three days worth or right. something, yes. you know? So, um, and, and my wife and I have kind of started noticing that I'm more irritable when I've been consuming sugar, like not initially, Initially, I'm fine, and that kind mm-hmm. of brings about this escalate uh, this um, uh, uh, 
not escalated, uh, yeah, escalated mood, right? Mm-hmm. Where, you know, yeah. I don't, I don't want to call it a high because I want to, I want to, because I still believe that I'm, that whatever symptoms I have are generally below what should properly be diagnosed as bipolar. Now, that's just my opinion. I'm not a doctor or whatever, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Maybe, and maybe I'm just burnt out on having them try to diagnose me with everything. Who knows? But, you know, so, so like that's one of the things that kind of will drive that, that will kind of push me up into this, you know, elevated state, you know, mm-hmm. mentally, emotionally and all that. Um, so I keep it extremely low. And, um, and then carbs also is another one. If I keep them, keep them low, then it just, it really helps with mental everything for me, right? Like memory, sure. memory, um, mood, uh, m- mood definitely for sure. And then also just, um, the ability to just sit down and think without feeling like your thoughts are just flying away from you. Um, yeah. because, um, you know, and I've, and I've had that my entire life, you know, like when I was a little kid, my mom said, I'm 43. Right. And so it's 2022 and I'm 43. So when I, you know, I was born in 1978. And so when I was a little kid, my mom said that they were like begging her to put me on medication. Um, you know, so I was, I was already kind of wild and, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, for me, it's, it's been diet, but I have heard of people saying things like, you know, working with your hands, doing stuff like that really mm-hmm. helps settle the mind a little bit. And I remember reading an article years ago that the Amish have very low rates of depression and they associated that, and I'm not sure how, but they associated it with the frequency at which they work with their hands. I interesting. Thought was, I thought that was interesting. And it's, I mean, it's been probably like 15 years since I read the article, so who knows how how well I'm remembering yeah. it. But, but, you know, but, I, but I've seen other things that suggest similar. Um, you know, just kind of like I love going out and working with tools and, you know, building wood stuff. And yeah. that's, there's just, there's something peaceful about that. Like I built oh, a absolutely. fence. I built a fence at my, at our house, four or five, um, five, five sections and a gate. I built the gate from scratch and I did some, nice. some, some interesting stuff with the, the, the panels that I bought. Um, because what I did was I routed them, I routed holes inside of the post so that they could, so that the, the, the cross beam would fit inside the post. Right. Okay. Um, so that was a little bit extra, a lot of extra work, but it was very, yeah. it was very fulfilling. And, you know, then to get it set up and then to see how it was level and stuff like that, you know, so, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And I think that, uh, I think this has been probably, I, I don't know. I keep saying this. I'm like, man, this is the most interesting conversation I've had so far. You know, and I just keep having more and more interesting conversations. You know, and I, th- you know, but I think this one kind of, um, I think it speaks to me more than others have because I can, I, I, I in a sense, I feel like I can, um. It's almost like, you know, you dip your toe in the water and you feel how cold mm-hmm. it is, even though your whole yeah. body hasn't been in there. I feel like yeah. this is kind of similar, right? Like, I don't really, I'm not, I, I wouldn't call myself in the water. Mm-hmm. Just hearing your story is kind of like dipping my toe in and I can kind of <laughs> feel a lot of things. You know, I think it's, I think it's very interesting yeah. um, to hear. And then, um, so I know we're coming up on our time and I don't want to hold you too long. Oh, no, um, you're good, man. This has been... Uh, this has been fun. But tell me, tell me what what are we missing here? What what do we not cover that maybe is is interesting? I think I think with all of this, um, for me, as a dad, as someone who's bipolar, as a as a salesperson, as a husband as you know, a member of a faith that asks a lot of its followers. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there is always this moment when you're discussing something and I, I'll say discussing instead of teaching because I'm, I'm not an expert on bipolar. So I haven't done any teaching tonight. We're just discussing. Sure. There's, there's that moment when you're discussing, when you can see the human connection Mm -hmm. is made. And this is such a, a passion point for me because 
I, I, mean, I am a people person. It has been miserable the last two years with my mm -hmm. job. Um, I, just to give you an idea, in 2017, I started in this current job, in this, in this category of, of job, and I flew, I, I made status with my airline in four months. Okay. And, and in 18, I did triple that. And in 19, I was flat. 20, I didn't fly. 21, I didn't fly until August 25th. Wow. And so getting back into being out with people. And I, I, my customers are on college campuses. And, you know, being able to sit with my customers and, and show them what I, what I sell and seeing them, seeing that moment of, oh, and I've seen that with you in that, in our discussion tonight of, oh, teaching my kids mm -hmm. and it, whatever it is, whether it's how to throw a, a, a Hail Mary pass on Madden right. or how right. to beat the bad guy on Minecraft dungeons or mm -hmm. how to do long division or how to build a bookshelf or whatever mm -hmm. that moment of spark in, mm -hmm. the, in the human mind whether it's my customer or my child or my friend on zoom that moment is so under it's underrepresented in the human experience right because we get caught up too much in this this i'm an expert and you listen to me and you shut up while i'm talking Right. But we all have so much to offer to each other in right. the discussion. And I think we all need to just remember at the root of everything, no matter who we are, whether we're libertarian or Republican or Democrat or Florida or Utah or black or white, people need people. Mm -hmm. And people have things to offer that other people need. Right. And we can't do this life thing by ourselves. We have our spouses, we have our children. That man, I need to go down to the hotel front desk, and I hope there's a smiling face there, not just an automated robot station. You know, right? People need people, and from the smallest stuff like at a hotel front desk to conversations like this that will mean something to me the rest of my life, mm -hmm. to you know, when I come home on from this business trip on Friday and my kids, Dad, you're home, and those hugs, right. man, those hugs are yeah. worth everything. People yeah. need people. Yeah, and I think that's that will help the mental health conversation mm -hmm. so much is, is a return realization of people need people. Right. And if we can amplify that, I think we could change the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I will hope that the conversation starts including men more yes, because, thank you. because unfortunately, you know, men, you know, men talking about mental health is taboo still. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, like if, like, if I tell people like, oh, if my mom was diagnosed with bipolar, people are like, oh yeah, well, you know, women and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like mm -hmm. this attitude, like, yeah, well, women get hysterical, yada, yada, yada. But if I, if I were to say like, hey, people have tried to diagnose me and who knows, maybe it's there. I don't think so, but maybe it is. Right. And yeah. people yeah. might be like, oh, and it's kind of like this standoffish moment, like, Rather than yeah. saying, they you know, know like, oh, you know, rather than saying, oh, well, how can I help? You know, what can I, what, how can I be there for you? You yeah. know, and I think we need to be more like that. Um, and, it, it, and it's not even the, the wimpy, like, oh, are we all going to cry and hold each other? Like, no, I don't want to cry and hold anybody. I don't, I like my personal space. I don't need to hold anybody, <laughs> you know, but, but every now and then maybe sympathize a little bit and be like, oh man, you're going yes. through a rough patch. You know, whether that rough patch is diagnosable or whether it's just a rough, you know, the, the standard rough patch that any human being can expect from life's regulars up, you know, regular ups and downs. Mm -hmm. You know, we have yeah. those and we have the more serious ones, but all of them right. are there and all of them need to be dealt with. So. Amen. Yeah, that's that's the game. So, well, well, it was great talking to you and I'm going to go ahead and you know, go, we'll, we'll go ahead and close this out, but, uh, thank you for Absolutely. coming on. My pleasure. And, Thanks and, for having and, me. And thank you for sharing your story.